We are in the Gospel of John, chapter number 1. And uh, really, we could read a lot of verses here, but for, uh, just for sake of time, and, and um, we're going to go to verse number 29 and just spend our time there this morning. We may well make references to some other scriptures, as always. The Bible says, preach the word. That's one of the reasons I like to give a lot of scripture when I preach, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. My words won't inspire faith, but the word of God will. And so, uh, let's read verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. That verse gives the answer to Isaac's question. You remember that when um, Abraham took Isaac upon the mountain to sacrifice him, and they were building the altar, they were putting the wood on the altar, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, where is the lamb? And John, I'm talking about almost 4,000 years later, John gave the answer, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, in that passage, the Bible said, Abraham responded to him and said, God will provide himself a lamb. Not that just he would provide it, but that he would provide himself as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so the Bible says they're going to worship. God told Abraham, we're going to go to the mountain and worship. And, uh, and they, his servants asked him, where are you going? We're going to Mount Moriah to worship. And he knew that he was going to, had been asked to sacrifice his son upon an altar upon Mount Moriah. That's the place where the temple is today. Uh, let me tell you this morning. We sang about the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And really, you cannot worship without the blood. There is no worship apart from the blood until a man comes into a, a relationship with Christ through his blood. He cannot worship. I've heard people say, and, and lost people say, Oh, I worship the Lord. No, you can't worship the Lord until you're saved. You can't worship him. You may say words. You may praise him. But it's not heard until you come under the blood. You cannot wor uh, worship without the blood. And you can't make too much of the blood. <laughs> you can't make too much of it. I'm talking about you can't preach on it enough. I mean, it is an, uh, a, a subject and a doctrine that has no end it is the beginning, in the very beginning, you know, when, Je when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says he clothed them in the skins of an animal. Where did that come from? It came from a lamb that was slain when God uh, walked into the garden that day and said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? He knew where Adam was. He asked the question because he wanted Adam to realize he had sinned. He was not where he was supposed to be. But I believe that when he came into the garden that day, he was carrying a lamb. He already knew the Bible says the lamb had been slain from the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, he knew that Jesus one day would come, and he knew that uh, he would be sacrificed upon Calvary for the sins of the world. He went create and created man anyway. He created man knowing that he would sin and it would demand the, the blood of his only begotten son. And so you can't make too much of the blood. The Bible says the blood washes away our sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Without the blood, he said in Hebrews, there is no remission of sin. It is the blood that appeases the divine wrath of God. The Bible says that man is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the Son of God. Everybody who is lost without God and without Christ is under the condemnation of God. The judgment of God hangs over them. And they could at once, in a moment of time, they could 
could experience the wrath of God. God could take them out. God could end their life at any moment and any time. And yet the Bible says that he came and he was the Savior of the world. And he appeased, appeased the, the wrath of God, that condemnation that hung over us, the wrath of God against sin. And you don't hear much. Everything you hear today on the radio, TV, and other places in most churches is all about the love of God. But the Bible talks about the wrath of God, and it's always the wrath of God against sin. He is righteous. He is holy. God hates sin. God will judge sin. God will put sinners in hell if they do not repent of their sin and they do not come to Christ and come under the blood. They will burn forever and ever and ever in a place called hell. But yet John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's John's answer to Isaac's question 4,000 years before that almost. And he said, Where is the Lamb? Our father Abraham, where is the Lamb? We've got the odor. We've got the wood. We've got the fire. But where is the Lamb? I'm going to tell you, John, on the banks of the Jordan River saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I'm glad one day that I came under the blood. I'm glad one day that Jesus saved me and forgive me when I came to the blood. It's not me. It's not anything I do. I am washed in the blood, cleansed by the blood, and so he is the Lamb of God. I want you to notice, first of all, this morning, behold the identity of the Lamb. Who is this Lamb? His identity is seen in the gracious promises of God in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the very time that Adam sinned in that garden, when Adam and Eve broke the law of God and they sinned, the Bible said that God gave them a promise. He said one day, remember that the devil came disguised as a serpent and beguiled them and deceived them. And he said to them, the, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. That was the gospel. That was the first time that we hear the gospel, that the seed of the woman, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, he was of the seed of Abraham. He was the seed of Mary, who was the seed of Abraham. And so we find that he was the Lamb of God, and God said, Behold, this seed of the woman, this Savior who is coming, will one day bruise the head of the serpent. He shall overcome the devil. He shall overcome sin. He will make things right when he comes. And there's also a promise of a kingly priest who would come. In Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12 it says, And he shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear the glory, and shall sit upon his throne, and a priest shall sit upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So here is the promise, and one of those Old Testament prophets said, there is coming a king who is also a priest. That had never been heard of. No priest ever became a king. There were prophets, there were priests, and there were kings in the Old Testament. All of them were of God. All of them were anointed by God. All of them were anointed with the oil by the Lord. And so we find that there is this promise. I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ is our great high priest, and he is our king. He is Lord of everything. And so there is that promise of a kingly priest fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And so his identity is seen in the promises of God in the Old Testament. His identity is also seen in the great pictures in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3, he's the lamb slain. That blood that was slain. We see uh, Cain and Abel. And how Abel brought the blood of a lamb and was accepted of God. But Cain brought of the fruits of his labor, his works, and said before God, he was rejected. And uh, God said to him, God, seeing life at the door, 
Uh, you're, you're just right at the door, but seeing life at the door, you don't come by good works. You don't come by bringing forth your own fruit. You come by the grace of God, by the blood of the Lamb, just like your brother Abel came, and he shed the blood of the Lamb. He knew that was the way. Adam had taught them the way, but in the garden, when they had first sinned against God, God brought a lamb and sacrificed the lamb. He was the substitute lamb of God. In Genesis chapter 22, we talked about Abraham. And Abraham uh, was going to offer Isaac his son. He drew the knife up as Isaac, Isaac laid upon the altar. Isaac had just said, where is the lamb? And Abraham had said, uh, God will provide himself a lamb. He looked and looked behind him, and there was called in the thickets a ram. And he took that ram and sacrificed him in the place of Isaac. Jesus is our substitute. He was sacrificed on the Calvary for you and me. He died for you and me. He took my place. He took your place upon Calvary. I should have been there. There's a song that says, I should have been crucified, but I was not crucified. And I have been redeemed from the condemnation, the wrath of God. And there's one reason, because of the blood of the Lamb. The Bible says he's the spotless Lamb. Think about it when they had the Old Testament <clears throat> Passover in Egypt. God said, you've got to go get a lamb, and it's got to be a spotless lamb. It cannot have any spot or blemish. And so they went to their flocks, and they picked out the perfect lamb. No spot, no blemish, no cuts, no bruises, no mange, no anything. A perfect little lamb. And they sacrificed the Lamb of God. Listen, He is the spotless Son of God. He is God the Son and the Son of God all at the same time. And He is perfect. He was without sin, the Bible says. And He came, the only one qualified, ever born of a woman, only one qualified to ever go to Calvary and pay for our sins because it demanded a spotless Lamb, without spot, without blemish. In Isaiah chapter 53, there is the suffering lamb. The Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed. And there on the cross and even before the cross, he suffered as no man suffered. Not only physically, but spiritually he suffered. He who was the spotless lamb of God, he who had never seen, the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, that he hath become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so this lamb, this spotless lamb, became the very essence of sin. Jesus did not become a sinner. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We ought to say thank God for the lamb. Thank God for Calvary. His identity is also revealed in the provision of Christ. When Isaac said, where? John said, behold, here stands the fulfillment. All the Old Testament pictures, all the prophets, all the promises of the Old Testament were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And a lot of that fulfillment took place on Calvary. When he died, God had said, there is a coming Redeemer. Moses even said, the one called Shallow will come, and he will be the Savior. He will be the Deliverer of God's people. And God provided a way of salvation. He provided a way of forgiveness. But it's up to you and me whether we get saved or not. God's not going to come down and wring your throat and set you down and make you get saved. You're going to have to choose to be saved. You're going to have to say, I want to be saved. I understand how to be saved. That's in your mind. I want to be saved. That's emotionally. And then your will, mind, emotions, will, you have to one day say, you know what? I will be saved. I will trust Jesus as my Savior. Wrong time, I knew about the promises of God. I knew the gospel. And there came a day when it came to work in my heart and you say, you know, I need to be saved. I really want to be saved. But there came that wonderful, glorious day on June the 15th, 1969, when I got on my knees and said, I will be saved. I will trust Jesus. I will trust the blood of the Lamb. And got saved and got born again. Behold, the identity of the Lamb is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we need to see the necessity of the Lamb. Not only does John call upon us to behold the identity of the Lamb, 
but also the necessity there is a lamb. There's one little word in the context which really graphically pictures the necessity of the lamb. It is the word sin. I am a sinner, therefore I need a Savior. I am a sinner, and I need to be saved. I am a sinner, and I need to come and understand who I am. I am a sinner. You have to come to that place where you say, I am a sinner. I am guilty. I deserve to go to hell. But Jesus loved me and died for me, and I can be saved. I will be saved by the grace of God. Sin reveals itself in the heart. Uh, the, the condition of the heart. The Bible said in Jeremiah 17, and he recorded often the heart is deceitful above all things and disreal wicked. But people don't understand. You go to people and they say, well, preacher, I, I'm not saved, but I'm a good person. I go to heaven. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. We do good in our own eyes, but in the eyes when we compare ourselves to the sinless Son of God, we do wrong. We are sinners. The Bible says our hearts are not only deceitful and wicked, but they're hard and impenitent. In Romans 2, 5, But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He said when people sit and they hear the gospel, if I go in somebody's home and they hear the gospel and they don't want to be saved, the God said they're hardening their heart. They have an impenitent heart. They have a heart that will not repent. And he said as they do that, they're treasuring up the wrath of God and the water's getting higher and higher and higher and one day the dam's going to break and they're going to face the judgment of God because they postponed and did not receive Jesus as their Savior. Your heart is hard. You come in and you hear the gospel of Christ. You can hear it in your home. You can hear it here. But when you hear the gospel of Christ, how can you not, how can your heart not be hard if you sit and hear about the suffering Savior, suffering on your part, and yet say no to God, no to Jesus. Sin is revealed in the conduct of our life, how we live. A polluted fountain will issue forth polluted waters. James said, how can a good fountain give forth evil water? How can an evil fountain give forth good water? It can't. What comes out of the heart, the Bible says, is wickedness. You know, when Jesus and they had washed, had eaten and without unwashed hands, the Pharisees came and said, oh, you're y'all dirty. He said, no, for it's out of the heart of man that proceedeth evil thoughts and adulteries and fornication and all those things. It comes out of here. Don't come out of there. That just is the temptation. That is just the trigger. But it says it comes out of the heart. And it produces the evil thoughts and the adulteries and all that kind of thing. Sin is the curse that has touched everyone's life. Sin is the curse of this world. When God cursed the world because of sin, Listen, the Bible says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And Jesus was took our curse. He became cursed for us. He came under the wrath of God for us. When he hung upon the cross, he said, Oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? It's because God cannot look upon sin. And God had to turn his eyes away from his only begotten Son of God, his beloved Son whom he loved, who was a part of him, who him sent to earth. But he could not look upon the Lord because he was bearing the sins of the world. And that sin demands a divine cure. There is no human cure. We've been here 6,000 years, and I'm telling you, there is no human cure. Look at our country today with all the things that's going on. All the crime, all the things that are happening is because of the wickedness of the human heart. 
and their world does not have the answer. Politics doesn't have the answer. White House don't have the answer. The politicians uh, don't have the answer. The Republicans or the Democrats don't have the answer. The answer is get back to Jesus and get back to the Word of God. Get back to what our founding fathers believed when they came over here on that Mayflower and set up 13 colonies, and they were religious colonies. Every one had a, had a charter that said a man a must uh, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to become a public official. We need to get back to that. The sin demands a divine cure, and that's all available only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it goes out to whosoever, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever. I'm glad the gospel says whosoever. I don't think there's a few elect few. I don't think that there's just a few that's going to be saved. God said there'll be a multitude in heaven that no man can number. And those are those who have come to Christ, who have repented, who have trusted him as their Savior, they will be in heaven. And God says it's only through the blood, whosoever, whosoever, let it ring out to the world today, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call upon him with a repentant heart, you call upon him with a believing heart, believing that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, that he's able to save you alone. He forgives you. You believe that. And then the Bible says that you surrender your life to him. He will save you. He will forgive you. He will make you a child of God. He will cause you to become a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for the blood. We wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be saved. I hate to think where I'd be if I hadn't been saved. I wouldn't probably be here at all. I'd probably be dead. I was one of those take a dare on anything. You didn't you didn't ever say, well, I dare you do that. I'd do it or die trying. Thank God I didn't die trying. Notice thirdly, the activity of the lamb. The activity of the lamb. He wasn't just a lamb. He came. He died. He was buried. He caused the dead to rise, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the crippled to walk. He was always busy. He said even to his mother, I must be about my father's business. And he, knew, he would recognize from time to time that the disciples were tired uh, traveling with him, and he would say, let's go to a mountain a while, rest a while, and pray a while. And he would take them and let them rest, really not because he needed to, as much as he realized they needed to. You notice those words in verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away, taketh away the sins of the world. That word takes away means the idea of lifting up or bearing off like a burden the sin of the world. Well, that's how I felt when I got saved. I feel like with the song we sing, uh, the burden rolled away. I'm so happy the burden rolled away. And I felt that. Boy, I felt that, that guilt and that burden and that heavy load I was carrying. Man, that shame and all the guilt that I had. And when I got saved, man, I felt the peace of God come in. That burden rolled off. I was no longer under that burden of sin. I was no longer living under the judgment of God. No, the Bible says he removes our sin completely. He bears it in his own body on the cross. Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now, if you start right here and go to the equator and go east, you'll continue to go east. You'll never come and start going west. Now, if you go north, when you get to the North Pole, then you start going south. And then to get to the South Pole, and you start going north, and it's south and north and south and north. But it's east all the way, east, east. I'm still going east. I'm still going in an easterly direction. I never go start going west automatically. I have to turn around to do that. The Bible says that's how far he put our sins from us, as far as not as the north is from the south, but as the east is from the west, you never... You never meet up with them again. 
you just keep on that way. Micah verse, chapter 7, verse 19 says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And now listen, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So far as they know, the, the deepest place in the ocean is seven miles deep. It's what they found so far. Who knows? But it means they're seven miles under the ocean. We've never been there. You've never been there. Very few people have been there. Nobody, I don't think, has been there. They just mapped it by radar and so forth and figured it's seven miles down there. In other words, he said, I'm going to bury them so deep and I'm going to cast them into the sea, the depths of the sea. And so there, as far as the east is from the west, my sins are in the depths of the deepest sea. So it is a removing activity. He removes our sins. It's a redeeming activity. He redeemed us by his blood. Uh, we were slaves to sin. The Bible says, He that sinneth is the servant of sin. And you're bearing the load, and there's a groaning in the heart of every man who realizes, I'm a sinner, I'm going to hell. Oh, yes. Heart groans under that burden. But thank God Jesus came to lift that burden. And by his blood he brought us out from under the curse of both sin and the broken law of God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18 For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation but received by the tradition of your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He said you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. You can't buy your way out of hell. You can't spend enough money and give enough money to this church to pay for your salvation. But thank God he said it's by the precious blood of the lamb slain without blemish and without spot. Galatians 3.13 says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. He hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Only the worst of criminals were hung upon the cross. There were thieves on one side and the other of Jesus. He had stole nothing. He had done nothing wrong. He was the perfect Lamb of God. But yet he was condemned with sinners. But yet God, he took our curse hanging on the tree. He took all the judgment of God and he bore, the Bible says, in his sins in his own body on the cross. And there he died bearing the sins of the world, bearing your sin and my sin and took them away and put them as far as the east is and the west, as far as the depths of the deepest sea. He hath redeemed us from our sins. It brings about a regenerating activity. In Titus 3, 5, not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. At one time I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and so were all of you. We were dead he said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, spiritually dead to God. I could not see God. I could not hear God. I had no relationship to God. I was as a dead man at a funeral. I was dead without him. But he gave new life. He gave abundant life. When I got saved, Jesus said, I came to give men life and life more abundantly. You know, a lot of people say, oh, preacher, I guess they won't have plenty more. Listen, I've had more fun in one day being a Christian than I had all the years I, I lived before I got saved. Amen. Thank God that he brings joy and peace and power into life. He can give you victory. He can bring peace and joy into your life. And you'll never be the same. He gave abundant life. The abundant life is only available in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, I like my life. You listen, you're not going to get saved till you get sick of your life and sick of your sin and sick of your uh, no relationship with God. You'll be dying, lost, and go to hell until you realize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. We have to recognize His identity. We have to acknowledge our necessity, 
I need to be saved. We have to appropriate by faith his activity. I think there the heart cries out, Where is the Lamb? And the happy response is, Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. Why could you turn that away? Why can you say no to Jesus? When he said, I've taken your sin. You come to me and you, you believe on me and trust me. You're willing to repent of your sin, turn from your sin, turn to the Savior. The Bible says this death alone is they turn from their idols to serve the living and true God. They turn from their idols. We all had idols. I had idols in my life. But when I got saved, they just sort of passed away. They just sort of drifted away. I love sports. But after I got saved, it was okay. I played sports, but I didn't love it like I used to. There's other things that I loved and were idols to me, certain people. But when I got saved, they drifted into the background, and Jesus came to the forefront. There comes that happy response. Behold the Lamb of God. Take away the sin of the world. You ought to say this morning, Behold the Lamb of God who wants to come and take away my sin. He wants to come and be my Savior. What a joy, what a privilege to be a servant, a ser to be saved by the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, listen, thank God for that day that I put my faith in His blood and I got saved, I got redeemed, I got born again. The greatest day of my life. Greatest day of my life. Today could be the greatest day of your life. You could look back and say on Sunday, October the 16th, I got saved, I got born again. Man, it'll make a difference in you, it'll make a difference in your relationship to others, it'll make a difference in your family. It just makes a difference. Everything's changed, everything. I mean, God come down, he turned me inside out and upside down, and I came out the better. And I came out, and, and somewhere along the way, God called me to preach. I went to Bible college and met Miss Vicki. We got married and moved to Pennsylvania, worked in the youth ministry up there, and we pastored churches, went to evangelism, preached in 22 different states while I was in evangelism for four years. Preached about 160 times in those four years. And that's 40 times a year. And uh, 40 weeks a year. And so, listen, it's untelling what God can do with you if you just give your life to Him. Let's bow for prayer, please.